Assalamu alaikum dear students. I am Sabahat Perveen, your instructor and guide for comedy of manners. And today we are going to have an overview of three great writers who have served English literature with their great works. We'll study about Henry Gibson, Oscar Wilde and Bernard Shaw. Henrik Ibsen, a Norwegian playwright who was largely responsible for the rise of modern realistic drama. It is said that Ibsen is the most frequently performed dramatist in the world after Shakespeare. Well, more details are given in the next slides and you may have a look later. Henrik Ibsen is famously known as the father of modern drama and it is worth recognizing. The Norwegian playwright was merely one of the wave of new writers to experiment with the dramatic form. Nor did he make some improvements, very small improvements, that were built upon by the successor. Rather, Ibsen himself conceived of how the theatre should evolve and against great adversity fulfilled his vision. Henrik Ibsen was born on 20th March 1928. Henrik Ibsen was a major 19th century Norwegian playwright. Ibsen is often referred to as the father of modern drama. Today, he is considered to be the greatest Norwegian author and is celebrated as a national hero by the Norwegians. However, there was a time when Ibsen was an object of criticism and condemnation not only in his contemporary Norway, but also in the continental Europe and in the conservative bourgeois society in particular. It is Ibsen who has given women a vigorous and strong voice through creating some powerful female characters like Hedda Gabler. Ibsen female characters are eminent in merit, intelligence, firmness, integ integrity, and in comparison with males. As one of the founder of the modernism in theatre, Ibsen is often referred as the father of realism and one of the most influential playwright of his time. His major works include Brand, The Enemy of An Enemy of the People, A Doll's House, Had a Gabbler, A Wild Duck, and The Master Build, and many more. He's most frequently performed dramatist in the world after Shakespeare and A Dollhouse was the mo world's most performed play in 2006. Ibsen is also ranked as one of the most distinguished playwrights in the European tradition. He is widely regarded at the, as the foremost playwright in the 19th century. He influenced other playwrights and novelists also, such as uh, George Bernard Shaw and Oscar Wilde. Ibsen was born into an affluent merchant family in a wealthy port town of Skien in Bradsburg. His parents were Nod Ibsen and Morrison. Henry Ibsen wrote that my parents were the member on both sides of the most respected families in Skien, explaining that he was closely related with just about all the patrician families who then dominated the place and its surroundings. He was the oldest of five children, and he expressed his interest in becoming an artist. His father's financial ruin would have a strong influence on Ibsen's later work. The characters in his plays often mirror his parents, and his themes often do with the issues of financial difficulty as well as the moral conflicts stemming from the dark secrets hidden from the society. Ibsen's which both model and uh, name character in his plays after his own family. A central theme in Ibsen's fab plays is the portrayal of the suffering women echoing his mother Moishin. Ibsen's sympathy with the women would eventually find significant expression with their portrayal in the dramas such as um, A Doll's House. Ibsen spent the next several years deployed at Dead North Theatre, where he was involved in the production of more than 145 plays as a writer, director, and the producer. 
During this period, he published five new, though largely remarkable, plays. Despite Ibsen's failure to achieve success as a playwright, he gained a great deal of practical experience at the Norwegian theatre, experience that was to prove valuable when he continued writing. He exiled to Italy where he wrote Brand, the tragedy. His play Brand in 1865 brought him the critical acclaim he sought, along with the measure of financial success. Well, with success, Ibsen became more confident and began to introduce more and more of his own ideas, his own beliefs and judgments into the drama, exploring what he termed the drama of ideas. His next series of the plays are often considered his golden age when he entered the height of the power and influence, becoming the center of the dramatic controversy across Europe. A Dollhouse was followed in 1879. This play is a scathing criticism of marital roles accepted by men and women which characterized Ibsen's society. Ibsen was already in his 50s when A Dollhouse was published. He himself saw his later plays as a series. At the end of his career, he described them as that series of dramas which began with a dollhouse and which is now completed with when we dead awaken. Furthermore, it was the reception of a dollhouse which brought Ibsen international acclaim. Late in his career, Ibsen turned to a more introspective drama that had much less to do with uh, denunciation of the society's moral values and more to do with the problems of the individuals. In such later uh, plays as Hedda Gabler and The Master Builder, I Ibsen explored psychological conflicts that transcended a simple rejection of current convention. Many modern readers uh, who might regard anti-Victorian didacticism as dated, simplistic, and hackneyed, have found these later works to be of more absorbing interest for their hard-edged objective consideration of interperson interpersonal con uh, confrontation. Hedda Gabler and a dollhouse are regularly cited as Ibsen's most popular and influential plays, with the title role of Hedda regarded as one of the most challenging and rewarding for an actress even in, even even in the present day. Ibsen had completely uh, rewritten the rules of the drama with the realism which was to be adopted by Chekhov and others, and which we see in the theatre of this day. From Ibsen forward, challenging assumptions and directing, directly speaking about uh, issues has been considered one of the factors that makes a play art rather than entertainment, and his works were brought to an English-speaking audience. Ibsen rose to the prominence in the large part because of his refusal to follow the rules of theatre at the time. His determination to forge his own style of drama coincided with the rising demand by the new intelligentsia for the serious, thinking theatre. Contrary to the frivolous entertainment on the mainstream stages, Ibsen realist plays such as A Dollhouse, Ghost, and An Enemy of the People were championed by the class of society upon their publication. Ibsen's major breakthrough in the uh, English-speaking world came the year before he wrote Hedda Gabler. The June 1889 production of A Doll's House at London Noelgy Theatre stating Janet as Nora launched the playwright into the, publication, into the public consciousness. London critics savaged the play in their reviews, but the show proved so popular that the run had to be extended. The influential London actor and manager Harley Gravin Becker Parker remarked 
that the play was talked on that the play was talked off and written about mainly abusively it is true as no other play had been for years ibsen did not just read the critical reaction to his plays he actively corresponded with the critics publishers theater directors and newspaper editors on this subject the interpretation of his work both by the critics and directors concerned him greatly he often advised directors on which actor or actress would be suitable for a particular role ibsen's plays initially reached a far wider audience as read plays rather than in performance On 23rd May 1906 Ibsen died in his home at Arbin State after a series of strokes in March 1900 When on 22nd of May his nurse assured a visitor that he was a little better Ibsen spluttered his last words on the contrary He died the following day at 2:30 p.m. Ibsen was buried in the graveyard of our savior in central Oslo. Now let's talk about Ibsen's Hedda Gabler. It was written in 1890. Hedda Gabler is a high point in Ibsen's creative life. Although the social dramas of his prose period depict full-bodied and believable characters, Ibsen achieved a psychological depth in Hedda Gabler that his later works never surpassed. Having investigated the feminine character in a male-oriented society, in a doll house, Ibsen enlarged his scrutiny to encompass to encompass the full pathology of the social female Although Hedda Gabler is an example of perverted femininity, her situation illuminates what Ibsen considered to be depraved society. Intent on sacrificing to its own self-interest the freedom and individual expression of most gifted members. The problem of Hedda Gabler illuminates the universal problem of women in the society built by the men. like Mrs Alving and Nora Hall Hedda must make an independent decision about her life women however in all but the most progressive societies are barred from participating in the world outside their household and are not equipped for independence outside their families thus Hedda Gabler despite a profound craving for independence has no personal resources with which to realize self responsibility having the desire but not the ability of constructing efforts at self determination had a become a modern media expressing her frustration in in destructive attempts at self realization not having any positive influence in the world had a gabler can only define herself negatively she destroys what she cannot accept undermining her husband with her coldness denying her pregnancy destroying atia's life work burning loveberg's creative product ruining the child's manuscript and finally committing suicide are all the poet attempts to satisfy her craving for life by depicting the pathology of frustrated women in hedda gabler Ibsen declares his most powerful protest against the double standard society. Okay, so this is just an overview of all the previous slides about Henrik Ibsen and I am going to read these points for you. Henrik Ibsen was born on March 20, 1828 in Skien, Norway. He exiled to Italy where he wrote Brand, the tragedy. Um he moved to Germany in 1868 where he wrote A Doll House returned to Norway as literary hero in 1891 he died in Oslo Norway on May 23 1806 
Now, if you want the detail of these points, you may look the previous slides again. Now, let's talk about Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde was an author, playwright, and poet. Oscar Wilde was a popular literary figure in late Victorian England. After graduating from Oxford University, he lectured as a poet, art critic, and a leading proponent of principles of aestheticism. In 1891, he published the picture of Dorian Gray, his only novel which was spent as a memorial by Victorian critics, but is now considered one of his most notable works. As a dramatist, many of Wilde's plays were well received, including his historical comedies, Lady Windermere's Fan, A Woman of No Importance, An Ideal Husband, and the most importantly, The Importance of Being Earnest, were his most famous play. In his lifetime, he wrote nine plays, one novel, and numerous poems, short stories, and essays. Oscar Wilde was born in Dublin on 16th October 1854. His father was a successful surgeon and his mother was a writer and a literary hostess. Wilde was educated at Trinity College. While at Oxford, Wilde became involved in a static movement. After he graduated, he moved to London to pursue a literary career. His output was diverse. The first volume of his poetry was published in 1881, but as well as composing verse, he contributed to publication as a Paul Mall Gazette. He wrote fairy stories and published a novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray, in 1891. He wrote his first play in 1883 and uh, in 1895 he wrote The Importance of Being Earnest. He was a popular literary figure in late Victorian. His greatest talent was for writing plays and he produced a string of extremely popular comedies including, um, Lady, uh, including Lady Windermere's Fan, a woman of no importance, an ideal husband, and the importance of being earnest. Uh, and now I'm just giving you the overview of Lady Windermere Fan, just to give you the overview of how the comedies of society works. Lady Windermere Fan was first performed on 20th of February 1892. This um, was just packed with the cream of society on the surface of a pity comedy. There is a subtle subversion underneath. It concludes with the with the collective concealment rather than the collective disclosure. The audience, like Lady Windermere, are forced to soften the harsh social cords in favor of more nuanced view. Upon graduating from Oxford. Wilde moved to London to live with his friend, Frank Miles, a popular protagonist among London's high society. There he continued to focus on writing poetry, publishing his first collection, Poems, in 1881. While the book received only modest critical praise, it nevertheless established Wilde as an up-and-coming writer. The next year, in 1882, Wilde traveled from London to New York City to embark an American lecture tour, for which he delivered a staggering 140 lectures in just nine months. Wilde was a proponent of a static movement, which, which emphasized aesthetic values more than moral and social themes. This doctrine is most clearly summarized in the phrase art for, sa for art's sake. Art for art's sake. A year after his wedding, Wilde was hired to run Lady Wor Ladies World, a once popular English magazine that had recently fallen out of fashion. 
During his two years editing Ladies World, Wilde revitalized the magazine by expanding its coverage to deal not merely with what women wear, but with what they think and they feel. Beginning in 1888, while he was still serving as editor of Ladies World, Wilde um, entered a seven-year period of furious creativity, during which he produced nearly all of his greatest literary works. In 1888, seven years after he wrote poems, Wilde published The Happy Prince and Other Tales, a collection of children's stories. In 1891, he published Intentions, an essay collecting arguing the tenets of aestheticism. And the same year, he published his first and the only novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray. The novel is a cautionary, cautionary uh, tale about a beautiful young man, Dorian Gray, who wishes uh, and receives his wish that his portrait ages while he remain young he remain youthful and lives a life of sin and pleasure while's first play lady windermere's fan opened in february 1892 to widespread popularity and critical acclaim encouraging wilde to adopt playwriting as his primary uh, literary form over the next few years while produced several great plays, witty, highly satirical comedies of manner and nevertheless contain dark and serious undertones. His most notable plays were A Woman of No Importance, An Ideal Husband and The Importance of Being Earnest. Around the same time that he was enjoying his greatest literary success, Wilde uh, commenced an affair with a young man named Lord Alfred. On February 18, 1895, Lord Alfred's father, the Marquis of Queensbury, uh, who had gotten wind of an affair, left a calling card at Wilde's home address to Oscar Wilde. Although uh, Wilde's relationship, uh, relationship was something of an open a secret he was so outraged by the queen's uh, queensberry's nod that he sued him for libel the decision ruined his life when the trial began in march queensberry and his lawyer presented evidence of wilde's relationship that quickly resulted in his own um, in his uh, arrest on charge of gross indecency Wilde emerged from the prison in 1897, physically, emotionally exhausted and flat broke. He went to exile in uh, France, where he living in cheap hotels and friends' apartments. He briefly re reunited with Alfred. Wilde wrote very little during this, these uh, last years. Uh, his only notable work was a poem he completed in 1898 about his experience in prison, The Ballad of Reading Go. What makes the importance of being earnest, unlike the three wild comedies that preceded it, a masterpiece of theatre, rather than merely an eminently stateable play? Well, perhaps a good clue to the answer can be found in Flay's subtitle, A Trivial Comedy for Serious People. This typically Wildean paradox has been variously interpreted. Whatever the author have intended by it, one thing the phrase suggests to the reader is that the importance of being earnest is worth the attention of serious people. Because it is unlike Wilde's other three comedies succeed in um, being utterly trivial and thereby attains pure comic excellence. Eric Bentley has remarked of the play that what begins as a prank ends as a criticism of life. Here at last, Wilde offered witty wordplay and exuberant high spirit in an undiluted form. There are no melodramatic ambiguities or dark, complex emotions in the importance of being earnest.
with the chief events of flirtation that leads to the engagement and prodigious assumption of tea and cucumber sandwiches. With this array of singularly unf unfettered characters, the importance of being earnest is not about domestic complications but about the act of committing oneself to domesticity. The social comedy of the play parallels the movement of Jane Austen novel. Characters who exist as pure potential define and place their themselves by choosing to marry and by selecting their particular mates. The choreography of this matrimonial ballad is exceptionally elegant particularly in the in commonly known three-act version. The dialogue is so uniformly delightful that it is impossible to single out or a high point or two of cutting. For the first time, Wilde's comedy is a um, brilliant whole rather than a series of sparkling effects. Indeed, the play's final uh, interchange between Lady Bracknell and her nephew newfound nephew uh, Jack could be the dramatist talking to himself for by taking comedy seriously enough to stay within its bound why did the dramatist finally achieve his goal for creating a play not merely well made but perfect of its own kind Wilde died of meningitis on November 30th 1900 at the age of 46, more than a century after his death, while is still better remembered for his personal life and um, his personality. Throughout his uh, entire life, Wilde remained um, deeply committed to the principle of aestheticism, principles that he expounded through his lectures and demonstrated uh, through his works, as well as any, any one of his era. Wilde wrote in the preface to the picture of uh, Dorian Gray, Those who go beneath the surface do so at their peril. Those who read the symbol do so at their peril. It is the spectator, and not life, that art really mirrors. Diversity of opinion about a work of the art shows that the work is new, complex, and vital. And now this is the overview of the previous slides about uh, Oscar Wilde, that he was born on 16th October 1854. His acclaimed works include um, the picture of Dorian Gray and the importance of being earnest. And uh, his writing style was witty. He was infamous for his imprisonment and he died on on November 30, 1900, or 1900. And if you want to know the detail of these points, you may uh, listen to the previous slides again. Now let's discuss about George Bernard Shaw. George Bernard Shaw was a famous Irish dramatist, literary critic, a social spokesman, and a leading figure in 20th century theatre. Shaw was a free thinker, a supporter of women's rights, and an advocate of quality, equality of income. During his long career, Shaw wrote over 50 plays. His plays were ideological attacks on the evils of capitalism and exploration of moral and social problems. He is the only so man so far to have won uh, both the Nobel Prize of Literature for St. John in 1925 and an Oscar for Best Screenplay Pygmalion in 1938. When he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature, he accepted the honor but refused the money. George Bernard Shaw was born on 26th of July 1856. He was known at his insistence simply as Bernard Shaw. He was an Irish playwright, critic, polemicist, and political activist. His influence on Western theatre 
culture and politics extended from the 1880s to his death and beyond. He wrote more than 60 plays, including major works such as Man and Superman in 1902, Pygmalion in 1912, and Saint John in 1923, with a range incorporating both contemporary satire and historical allegory. Shaw was born in a lower middle class part of the Dublin. He was the youngest child and one and only one son of George Karsha and Lucinda Elizabeth. Shaw from family was English descent and belonged to, dom uh, to belong to dominant Protestant ascendancy in Ireland. George Karsha, his father, he was alcoholic and was among the family's less successful members. Between 18, 1865 and 1871, Shaw attended four schools and all of which he hated. His experience as a schoolboy left him disillusioned with formal education, schools and schoolmasters. He later wrote, were prison and turnkeys, in which children are kept to prevent them disturbing and uh, Chamfering their parents. In October 1871, he left school to become a junior clerk in Dublin firm of land agents, where he worked hard and quickly rose to become head cashier. During this period, Shaw was known as George Shaw. After 1876, he dropped the George and styled himself Bernard Shaw. The mid-1880s marked a turning point in Shaw's life. He had two novels published and began a career as a critic. Arms and the Man is a comedy by, is comedy by George Bernard Shaw, whose title comes from the opening words of Virgil's. The play was first produced on 21st April 1894 and published in 1898 as part of Shaw's Plays Pleasant volume, which also included Candida, you, can, you Never Can Tell, and The Man of Destiny. Arms and the Man was one of the Shaw's first commercial successes. He was called into the stage after the curtains, where he received enthusiastic applause. During the first decade of 20th century, Shaw secured a firm reputation as a playwright. In 1904, Harley Granville Barker established a company at the Royal Court Theatre to present modern dramas. Over the next five years, they staged 14 of Shaw's plays. The first John Bull's Other Island, a comedy about an Englishman in Ireland, attracted, le attracted leading politicians and was, um, and was seen by Edward Savon, who laughed so much that he broke his chair. After the First World War began in August 1914, Shaw produced the tract Common Sense about the war, he, which argued that warring nations were equally culpable. Shaw's first major work to appear after the war was Heartbreak House, written in 1960s to 1970s and performed in 1920s. It was produced on Broadway in November and was coolly received, according to The Times. Mr. Shaw on this occasion has more than usual to say and take twice as long as usual to say it. After the London premiere in October 1921, The Times uh, concurred with the American critics as usual with Mr. Shaw. The play is about an hour too long. Shaw's first play of decade was Too True to Be Good, written in 1931 and premiered in Boston in February 1932. 
During the decade, Shaw traveled widely and frequently. Most of the journey with, uh, were with Charlotte. She enjoyed voyages on ocean liners and he found peace to write during the long spells at sea. Shaw published a collection edition of his plays in 1934, comprising 44 works. Shaw's first three full-length plays dealt with social issues. He later grouped them as plays unpleasant. Widower's house concerned the landlord of slum properties and introduced the first of Shaw's new women, a recurring feature of later plays. The Philanderer develops the theme of new women, draws on Ibsen, and has element of Shaw's personal relationship. The character of Julia being based on Jenny Patterson, in, two, in a 2003 studies, Judith Evans described Mrs. Warren's profession as undoubtedly the most challenging of three plays unpleasant taken by Mrs. Warren's profession. Shaw followed, Shaw followed the first trilogy of with a second published as Plays Pleasant. Arms and the Man Concealed Beneath, a mock Ritanian comic romance, a Fabian parable contrast, contrasting impractical idealism with, pragmat with pragmatic socialism. The central theme of the Canada is a woman's choice between two men. The play contrasts the outlook and inspiration of Christian, socialist and a political and a poetic idealist. The third of the pleasant group, you never can tell, portrays socially um, uh, social uh, mobility and the gap between generation particularly in how they approach social relation in general and mating in particular. The three plays uh, for uh, Puritans comprising The Devil's Discipline, Caesar and Cleopatra, and Captain Brass Browns, Captain Brass Browns Conversion, all center on question of empire and imperialism, a major topic of political discourse in the 19, in 1890s. In Shaw's views, the London theatres of the of 1890s presented too many revivals of old plays and not enough new work. He campaigned against melodramas, sentimentality, and stereotypes and worn out, worn out conventions. Shaw's contribute, Shaw contributed uh, more than 150 articles as a theatre critic, as theatre critic for the Saturday Review in which he assessed more than 212 productions. Shaw maintained a provocative and frequently self-contradictory attitude to Shakespeare. Many found him difficult to take seriously on this subject. Pygmalion is a play by George Bernard Shaw named after a Greek mythological figure. It was first presented on stage to the public in 1930. The theme of Pygmalion by George Bernard Shaw is social classes and manners. Living in poverty and struggling from day to day can be a very difficult way to live your life. Most of us, if given the opportunity, would try to make changes to uh, make our life better, to make our situations better if we could. Pygmalion is a play by George Bernard Shaw that tells the story of a poor young flower girl who has been disrespectful and disrespected and overlooked because of her appearance and the dialect she speaks. When given the opportunity, she decides to get to the language lessons in order to gain the respect of others and improve her overall status in life. The outcome, the outcome of her training is not uh, what she expected and she is not only able to change her appearance and speech but also gain confidence in her own abilities. Bernard Shaw died on uh, 2nd November 1950s due to uh, his kidney failure. There are various Marxist themes throughout Pygmalion, one of which is Marxism. The whole character of Mr. Doolittle is an embodiment of Marxism as Mr. Doolittle rapidly criticized societal traditions that are simply performed because it is a social convention. Mr. Doolittle decides to reject these traditions as he is too poor to afford them and hence society looks down upon him. 
However, in the end, when Mr. Doolittle obtained a job with a stable income, he suddenly succumbs to society's convention and marries his long-time partner. This change in attitude brought by the influx of money supported the Marxist theory that society should not be ranked, but and rather there should be economic equality as people simply have morals because they have something to lose. In addition, the fault of the um, upper class is further shown through Eliza. Eliza undergoes a, super, a superficial transformation involving her accent, clothes, and manners. So she is able to mingle with the upper class unnoticed. Feminism is also a prominent theory throughout the novel. Mrs. Pierce is a huge testament to feminism for even through she is a maid to Higgins. She can easily overpower him as shown when she scolded him for taking Eliza in quickly without thinking of the consequences. This trait is also seen in Mrs. Higgins as she serves as a matriarch of the family and further scolds Higgins during their meeting with the uh, with Ansford Hills. Alisa is further support for feminism as she undergoes a huge transformation during the narrative. Shaw also uses Pygmalion to emphasize the strength and weakness of pure logic mindset as shown as uh, see through Higgins. Higgins is a brilliant linguist and scientist, but his brute force attempt, them, uh, attempt through life uh, emanates a personality of overt frankness and rudeness. Hence, Higgins is all uh, is alone in life without a partner. In fact, he only co uh, company uh, is Mrs. Purse and Pickering. The letter of which has sh um, just shown up in his life recently. This fact is further supported by the fact that Eliza left Higgins. Eliza left Higgins because he treats everyone rudely and he does not fully grasp the social concept of being compassionate or kind even if it may not always be easy. Well, this is the overview of the previous lives of George Bernard Shaw. Uh, that he was born on 16th of October 1854. He was an Irish uh, playwright, critic, polemicist, and a political activist. He won the uh, Nobel Prize for Literature in 1925. Shaw's first three full length plays dealt with social issues, and the details are given uh, in the previous slides too. And Bernard Shaw died on 2nd November 1950 due to, 50 due to kidney failure. And if you want the detail of this, these points, uh, you can see the previous slides too.